A uh, question for Dr. Kirsten. So given the, the Geron uh, situation, and with the hope that that will move forward, do you anticipate that your current work with you know, changing astroglial scar and the motor neuron, the purified motor neuron, do you see any economic opportunities for those going forward in, in, a, in a developmental way in the same way that Geron trial move forward? You know, each of these approaches are distinct. And I think that as a community, we're very naive indeed if we think that we should put all our eggs behind in one basket. Um, I think we're seeing now in the clinic throughout the world that if you put pretty much anything into the spinal cord that's young, it secretes growth factors, causes a beneficial effect, like the oligodendrocytes, like the stem cell zinc trial, like the neural stem trial. Picking the right cell type is one major challenge. But when you get into the deep depths of clinical translation, you realize that the challenges are immense. The reasons that the Geron trial shut down, I, I'm actually not even prohibited to talk about <laughs> because I've, I've reviewed this stuff and I'm under confidentiality. But suffice it to say that there, it's a very complex process when you ramp up manufacturing ramp up manufacturing for a cell transplant technology and the costs become sometimes out of control. They be just become unwieldy. Now some cells and some approaches are going to be very inexpensive and some are going to be very expensive. They're going to be inexpensive in some countries and expensive in others. Some countries they're going to go really quickly through the clinical process, meaning cheap, to the company bearing that bill others, it's going to take a great long time. Some of the approaches are going to come with a great deal of risk and that inserts things called process controls and higher batch release criteria, a higher bar for the product. That means money. So it's one thing for a group of scientists to sit around and throw out a whole bunch of shots on goal, like I'm doing, and that's a really good thing. Once we see some amazing results like the Tajinsky lab, like we've seen from the Anderson lab and uh, my lab previously, etc., then we enter a new realm of how do we translate this thing and what are the cost of goods and what's the burden, what's the likelihood, what are the risks. That's an entirely new set of challenges. And frankly, the research community should be empowered to do their work without those challenges because they evolve over time. So my answer, I know it's a long one, but we really do need to have several shots on goal because we don't know which ones are going to make it in the end. We could never have foreseen the, the challenges that Geron had financially until this point in development. There may be other problems ahead, and it's going to be great to have several shots. All right, that's a, that's a great point. But you know what, we all have to thank Hans because he gave us the first shot. The first human clinical trials NIH approved came from Dr. Hans Kierstad's lab, and that is groundbreaking. All right, who's next with a chance to talk to these great scientists? Bring up a question. If not, you can, right, here we go. Right here in the front, right here, your hand was up. But you, turn around. You're, you, you were first. Yeah, you were first. You're, yeah, you were first. Come on up. Yeah. we got to be fair. You can first, first up, first get it. Paul, um, I wonder if you could uh, comment. There's almost, to my mind, there's almost too much uh, regeneration and growth coming on from those cells. So a couple of points that maybe you could uh, touch on is, is it possible to reduce the amount of cells you're actually transplanting, so maybe do a dose response? Because there's probably quite a lot of redundancy there. They can't all be making functional connections, given also that you got a, you know, a, a, a decent functional recovery, but it wasn't spectacular. So in longer term, do you see or have you looked for dieback of cells of those fibers which have not made connections? So how long beyond your transplant have you actually looked to see whether eventually some of those cells and those fibers die back? That's, that's great questions. Yes, you're right. So, so in the beginning, we, we go to a very extreme situation, complete transaction. And it's a very severe transaction. Yes, we tend graph more cell just to fill, complete fill the lesion cavity. But in a reality, a clinically relevant uh, injury model should be contusion, smaller, 
and we should do the dosage, uh, uh, different dosage response. I agree with you, there are too much axon to grow. So this is just show the potential in an extreme, say, extreme case, we have too much axon to grow. Act, it, it is true, the next question is how we can control this growth. Can we direct this growth to the right target? Some growth may be wrong. It looks like they're bi-directional. It's randomly to grow. So that's some potential problem. Dr. Mark Tusinski didn't mention that. But when we look deeply, the, the real growth from the development, it's a high organized guiding the growth. But this might be random growth. So to control, uh, it's a very, very important point we need to address. The next is to see the long-term effect. Act now we, uh, we graph both the red cell and human cell, especially the human cell, we try to do maybe a one-year long-term study. We already graphed some animals, the animals still survive. So the question is, right, do this axon uh, still exist after half year, after a year? Uh, the, the original development theory is that those new axon, whenever it's activate, act it's through the activity, so it will strain. And those axons, too much other axons that didn't connect well will be eliminated. So we'll, we'll verify this in the long-term study. Thank you. That's going to be a very important long-term study. Yes, next question. Uh, this is another one uh, for Paul. I know that Dr. Tuszynski said that the early stage neural stem, cell, cell, stem cells that were transplanted, about 25% became neurons, 25% oligodendrocytes, and 15% became astrocytes. Is, yeah. is that, that's correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, so is that ratio reflective of what occurs naturally in the spinal cord, or is that, like, a, is that different from the normal amount of cells that make up uh, the spinal cord in terms of how, what percent is astrocytes versus oligodendrocytes versus neurons? I think it's, it's close to, uh, to the nature development because this cell act, we isolate from the development spinal cord. It's a fresh dissociate cell. We transplant them within an hour. So we, we didn't culture them, we didn't alter them uh, except the growth fat cocktail that's a protein, it should be a short term because protein will be gone after transplant, maybe I would say a day or two. So there may not uh, uh, affect them for long term. But as I understand, uh, the development stage might be the, the neuron and the glial might be, I would say, two to one ratio. There, there's some earlier study act quantify how many glial, how many neuron in the normal spinal cord. I would say it's close to that. We didn't, I, I don't think we alter their, their differentiation potential too much. Okay. Don't all raise your hands at once, but let's, let's get them up there. All right, have one over here. Yes. Easy. Um, when Dr. Zasinski was talking about the growth factor cocktails, you know, like 12, 15 years ago, and I was st just starting to learn some of, you know, the science behind this, um, you know, when we were talking about yesterday with the Manhattan Project, when they started that, there were like six or seven different sites working on different particular parts of the project. Um, he mentioned, like, going back to GAP43 and T3, BDNF as growth factors. Do we pretty much have a good group of growth factors so that kind of that particular area of going forward is kind of we've got it well maybe not totally conquered but we've got a good hold on that air, one area is this one we can kind of scratch off the board is okay this part's pretty good uh, yeah this is actually it's, it's, it's my own inside story it, it's uh, the reason for that is the early fetal or spinal cord graph, like uh, 20 years ago, uh, the, the, they can survive, but not completely fill the large cavity. Usually smaller lesion, they fill up better, but
but large lesion, they fill up poorly. And, and later also, the Miami Project, uh, a transplant Schwann cell. I mean, it's very, very good transplant, I mean, the end result. But later, when they label their graft cell, they find out like 85% cell die. But the interesting part for the Schwann cell transplant is that their graft Schwann cell, then the, the, the graft Schwann cell will attract your endogenous Schwann cell come in. So the end result is you still have a lot of Schwann cell, but the original transplant cell die too. So that's how I begin to think how we can uh, uh, to risk this cell, especially in the beginning. And I talked to the Miami Project. They use this anti epitopsis agent. But I add growth factor because we graph early stage neuron and the neural stem cell. They need, a, for example, they need a neurotrophic factor to support their survive. And also they need stem cell proliferation factors to, to let them continue to divide maybe a few more time before they mature so they can fill up the lesion cavity. Another more important factor, a category of factor, is act, it's the blood, new blood vessel formation factors. You have a large graph. They need new blood vessel, uh, the, the nutrition support. And so, so some of the factor act specific design to attract uh, this new vessel formation. But now it's, it might be too much. We act, we, now we try to see, uh, to test individual axon, to, to, to test individual factors and combination to see if we can reduce them to identify those essential. That's for the clinic relevant translation. All right, one in the back over there. Oh, how you doing? Uh, I wanted to know how long do you think it'll probably be till we see any of this until the first clinical trial? Well, the, um, I spoke of four different approaches in my talk. The first approach is in the clinic right now, so five humans have been treated with it. And um, when it gets back on track again, that'll just continue. The second approach with motor neurons is going to begin in 2013, probably in the first or second quarter, likely the first quarter. The uh, other two approaches that I talked about are preclinical. So they are, it's going to be a little while before okay. those things get into human clinical trials. Uh, fortunately, every subsequent approach so is sped up tremendously. So, so the motor neuron too. approach, for example, um, took one eighth of the time and one fortieth of the money than the oligodendrocyte approach. So things get faster and cheaper. That's good news. But um, I think that's the answer for mine. What about yours? Yes, actually, we uh, thanks for the the Remory of the funding support. Thanks for the California CERM grant support. We get the grant support us for like three, three or four years for per clinic translational study. So we conduct research on the monkey study. So uh, ours maybe takes a few more years. We may go to clinic trial. All right, thank you all so much. And uh, kind of wrap this all up. One of the greatest hurt, hurt, hurdles in lifting weights was the 500 pounds. No one could actually get 500 pounds over their head. They got to 490 and they stuck for 17 years. They couldn't get it. It was such a, it was such a huge hurdle. They thought it was almost impossible. A guy, Vasily Alexiev, I shook his hand one time. It was like shaking a bear's hand. He, he did it, 500 pounds. He lifted it up. It was the pride of Russia, the pride of a nation. And it takes a champion like that. No one could pass and get under four minutes on the mile, and Floyd Bannister did it, and then everything broke open after that. It takes a champion, it takes a hero to be that first person. Hans Kirstad is that first person. He started America's first human clinical trials with embryonic stem cells, and now that whole, whole clinical trials is opening up now. You have uh, Stem Cells Incorporated, they have human clinical trials over in Switzerland. You have so many different ways now to go after it. 
But if there had been a calamity, if there had been cancers, if there had been adverse effects, the whole clinical trials of stem cells would have been shut down as a field, not just for spinal cord, but for Parkinson's, MS, everything. It took a hero and a champion. Everyone here owes a debt of gratitude to this man, Hans Kirstad. I think that's a good time to end it. If we can have, uh, have our great Marilyn here, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conference, and uh, thank you all for having me so much.